You can hardly delve anywhere in any area of human endeavor, not just in science, and not find the Royal Society at the very heart of things. Which raises a fourth extraordinary point about the Royal Society. It is still here. More than that, it is still here and it is still important. Now, how many enterprises can you name that are still doing today what they were formed to do 350 years ago? Today, the Royal Society's interests remain an inspiration to recite. It provides 350 research fellowships, and its grants support the work of 3,000 scientists all over the world. It bestows great numbers of medals and prizes, maintains an active program of lectures and debates, and beholds a beloved summer science exhibition. It acts as the scientific conscience of the nation. It publishes seven journals and an endless stream of papers. It remains emphatically international in its outlook, maintaining close links with 91 science academies around the world. As I said in my introduction to the book, if we have an Earth worth living on 100 years from now, the Royal Society will be one of the organizations our grandchildren will wish to thank. It is impossible to list all the ways that the Royal Society has influenced the world, but you can get some idea by typing in Royal Society as a word search in the electronic version of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. That produces 218 pages of results. That's just lists of names, 218 pages of them. It would take you six months to read through all of the entries. It is more central to the life and history of Great Britain than most people realize. If you removed from the historical record all that the fellows of the Royal Society have done, you would have to rediscover or reinvent photography, the internet, bank holidays, the theory of evolution, antibiotics, the understanding of gravity, the unraveling of DNA, the whole of the electronics industry, Big Bang theory, and literally uncountable hundreds and hundreds of thousands of vital things more.